Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with Dave's Faves. And today I want to talk to you about one of the great romantic symphonies. I mean really great romantic symphonies. It is George Lloyd's 11th, and it was written in 1985. What, you say? A romantic symphony written in 1985? It could be some sort of some sort of strange throwback, some albatross of, of a, a decadent and no longer valid musical aesthetic? Bullshit, I say. Romantic symphonies are what they are. I actually have to expound upon this a little bit because I have a thing about periodicity in music. I, I was trained as like a historian. I mean a real one, not a music historian. That's where I have my degrees. And, and history as, as a discipline, um, if you look at it and you analyze it, you, 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 there are many ways to do history. Let me just put it this way. And one of the worst kinds I was taught, and I actually believe this is true, is to write winner's history. Now, winner's history can be very useful. Most, for example, nationalistic histories are winner's history. You know, you exalt the nation by talking about its fabulous victories. You know, the biggest, the biggest perpetrators of winner's history are the French, you know, because they built a monument to every defeat that they ever suffered. If you look at Paris, it's nothing but monuments built to commemorate defeats. The Arc de Triomphe is, you know, the end of the Franco-Prussian War. The Place de la Concorde is Napoleon getting trounced. You know, it's marvelous to look at all that stuff. But, you know, in general, what I'm saying is that music history is one of the very, very worst um, examples of winner's history. And we're experiencing something of that now because people are going back, we're starting to broaden our view of music history and reclaim female composers, African-American composers in the United States, composers who were, for whatever reason, sidelined. Now, part of the problem of this process is that the standard, standard periodicity, that is, in the winner's history, is that music falls into these nice, juicy, convenient periods, which feature famous composers who we think were the most important in those periods. They never were in their own lifetimes, but that's another issue. And we, we trace the thread of great music as the parade of progress in terms of period after period, succeeding period, and these composers succeeding each other. And we know that's not what happens at all. That has nothing to do with what people actually listen to and what was being played and who the most famous composers were in the day. And we have to distinguish between the qualitative version of history, which is you know, music which, which we value today for whatever reasons we value it, because it, it has certain qualities and, and they're very real, which are quantifiable. And then there's the, the more sort of like historiographical, you would call it, version of history that is trying to understand what happened in a particular period as those who lived in that period would have seen it, rather than merely as we value it now rewriting history in hindsight to say that what happened back then you know, or that what we value now is actually what the story was back then, which is just totally wrong, totally and completely wrong. How does, what does this have to do with George Lloyd? Well, it actually has quite a bit to do with George Lloyd because George Lloyd was a genuine romantic composer in the sense that he wrote music that was based on melody and great greatly colorful orchestration and and extreme emotional states and those extreme emotional states sometimes took precedent over ideas such as formal elegance or contrapuntal whatever the music is not always analyzable in strictly scientific terms as determined by german nationalist musicologists during the 19th century to exalt their own national music over every other kind that's another aspect of our winner's history perspective which is just horrible in my view and because it, it just limits what music can be so so terribly. Um, but anyway, anyway, Lloyd was just that type of composer. And what we're going to find, I really think what we're going to find, I predict, 
with my crystal ball what we're going to discover 300 years from now fortunately i'll be dead so no one can say whether i was right or wrong at least who's around now but what we're going to eventually discover i think is that our whole conception of periodicity, of where the Romantic period ended, where contemporary music started, all that stuff, is wrong. Because that's not going to be what people several hundred years hence value. They're going to find the pieces that they like. They're going to say those were the most important pieces. And they're going to reimagine music history to create an unbroken thread between those. And I have a very, very strong suspicion that the entire atonal, dodecaphonic, serial interruption is going to be is going to be cataloged as just a a minor diversion in the grand progress of tonal music which is basically you know based on on the human voice on expression of emotion of you know it's not going to be based on harmonic process or contrapuntal anything i mean there'll be composers who use those techniques but the music as a whole i mean you know, it really was going like gangbusters, romantic music. It was beautiful. Aside from Germany and academic serialist composers in various countries, you know, people in the United States and the universities and Pierre Boulez and those people, the vast majority of composers at any given time were writing what we would consider to be harmonically conservative tonal music, sometimes in extended tonality, sometimes whatever, but it was there. It was the backdrop to what they were doing. And some of them were more, were more imaginative than others, and some of them were just really, really good at what they were doing using traditional means. And George Lloyd was one of those. He was very, very good at what he did. And what's more, he knew what he could do. And he didn't try to write outside that which he knew he did best, which is always a good sign in a composer. You know, when composers are just following the crowd, then, you know, you, you, you're, nine times out of ten, you're getting junk. You really are. Lloyd had his personal style. He had a genuine melodic gift. He had a fabulous gifted orchestration. He wrote symphonies and concertos and operas and grand choral works. And that was what he was. And he was roundly trashed for it, which is just awful. I mean, he couldn't get a break in the 50s and 60s, particularly the 60s and 70s, when the serialists were running things and the coterie of modernists at the BBC in Britain were controlling what was getting played and what wasn't getting played. He was considered hopelessly retrogressive, and it was nothing of the kind. Nobody's really retrogressive. I mean, people are contemporary composers. They live in their time. They write music of their time. And if it sounds like music of previous times, okay, so what? Who cares? Because our sense, once again, of periodicity is so small, particularly when we're very close to something. You know, when we're really close to something, we begin to break it up into little sniglets. Look at, look at how pop music runs. You know, it goes by decade. Oh, the music of the 60s. Oh, the music of the 70s. Oh, the music of the 80s. What in God's name is the difference between any of that stuff? It's a song. It's in verse and refrain form. It has a rhythm section. It has a guitar. I mean, you know, basically the differences between those decades in terms of what the music was are, are musically speaking, totally irrelevantly minuscule. And yet people will say, oh, that's the 60s, that's the 70s, that's the 80s. Well, it's the same thing with art music. With classical music, we know because people want to be singled out in some way. And one way to single them out is to create an entire aesthetic period around what they were doing, whether or not the differences between one thing or the other are significant. It all matters what we, the only thing that matters is what we listen to. But as the time expands, these periods congeal and become longer. I mean, when I was, when I was growing up in the 60s and 70s, Mahler was supposed to be the last gasp of romanticism. The Romantic Symphony died with Mahler. Well, you know, I mean, that's totally wrong. <laughs> I mean, what about Shostakovich? What about Prokofiev? What about Von Williams? What about, what about you know, Jolie Braga Santos in Portugal? What about, you know, there are just millions of composers who wrote beautiful, beautiful symphonies in a recognizably romantic idiom, often influenced or inspired by Mahler. And he was not a, an end. 
he was the start of a regenerated view of the symphony, in my, in my opinion, because he inspired a whole raft of other composers. And so that tradition continued. It may not have continued in Germany, but who gives a damn about what's happening in Germany? What happens is, what matters is what's happening everywhere and where we find the music that we love to listen to. And that's our history of music. And so George Lloyd belongs to that school. And let's remember, the entire 20th century school of British music, yes, there were composers who did atonal crazy stuff and avant-garde British composers, and those are the ones who got a lot of play and a lot of attention, but I don't think they were the best composers. We all know that the composers we are interested in as listeners, my crowd, what do we like? We like Britton and Bax and Berkeley and Rawthorn and Goosens and Walton and, and Tippett, at least the early stuff. And, you know, we like these composers because they wrote fresh, original music in a recognizable style that appeals to us and that speaks to us. And that is the only thing that makes any difference, not some sort of, you know, pinhead winner's history rewritten to exalt people that nobody cares about. And Lloyd deserves to be cared about. Now let's talk about the 11th Symphony and why it matters and why it's fabulous. This was theoretically going to be Lloyd's last symphony. It was commissioned by the Albany Symphony. He wrote it in 1985. It was premiered in 1986. They recorded it in this glorious, glorious sound here on Albany Records. It is a, 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 an hour-long life's work of a symphony. It's an extravaganza. It's written for a big orchestra. It has five beautifully proportioned movements. It's in perfect Bartokian arch form, actually. It has a vivo first movement, then a slow movement, then a leggero, a brillante scherzo, and then a grave slow movement, and then a really ball buster <laughs> of a finale. It's, and the ending is con exaltation, esaltazione with exaltation, and it, it, it's just marvelous. It's full of good tunes, it's powerful, the climax is all just, just nail you to the wall. This is a guy who really knows what he's doing, and this is a magnificent recording of, of it. It's the only one there is, and uh, so it really belongs in the collection of anyone who really enjoys romantic symphonies. Big, beautiful, colorful, shameless, <laughs> romantic symphonies. It's that simple. And I know this was took me a long time to get here, and I apologize for that. But, you know, works like this really do, I think, ask questions about how we consume and receive music and, and how pieces that, that I think deserve a lot more attention than they get come to our notice. Thank God for recordings. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, what would happen if... if, if we didn't have access to recordings regularly in order to enjoy this and to see how there's this sort of cognitive dissonance between the music that we like and the music that people wrote and the music that academics tell us mattered. It's a big, big conundrum. And uh, the only answer to it is to find the stuff you like, which thank God is available, and enjoy it to the max. So keep on listening, friends. Thank you so much for joining me. Take care.